Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, County Administrator and co-host of this program. But as you can see, my fearless leader, Chairman Mike Vandersteen, isn't with us today. In fact, for those of you who follow this program, I'd like to share that Mike has now undergone his second significant surgery on an ankle. First, he did one foot and was laid up for a few months and then did the other. And uh, Mike has just been an excellent county board chairman and a, a true professional and excellent co-host of this program as well, as you certainly know. If you know Mike or you follow this program, I would encourage you to pick up the phone and, and give him a call. He's resting comfortably at home. He's going to be there for a while. If you get a chance to drop him a note, but uh, please extend your support to him. I can't imagine being laid up for that length of time, you know, three, four months for both ankles, significant reconstruction surgery and to have the positive attitude that Mike has displayed and continued to be an active leader with county government. So, Mike, if you're watching this, speedy recovery. Look forward to having you here soon. And again, if you, if you think of it, please drop them a note. Today, I'm very pleased that, speaking of health, our Health and Human Services Director, Tom Egerbrecht, is with us. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Adam. It's great to be here. Tom's been our director now for a little over two years and certainly hit the ground running. And out of our 20 departments leads the largest with over a $31 million budget and a lot of very good employees doing very important work. Uh, Tom, again, it's nice to have you here today. Please begin by sharing a, just a little bit about yourself. How did we get such a experienced, knowledgeable director like yourself to come to Sheboygan County? Uh, I have known a number of people uh, who've worked for Sheboygan County over the years, Adam. I came here from Brown County most recently and had the uh, pleasure of working with a whole lot of people that have been affiliated with Sheboygan County over the years. I think it's a beautiful community. Um, when the opportunity came up, I felt it compelled to take a look at it. Um, I did, and I'm just extremely blessed to be here and working with you. And by the way, the, everything you said about Mike Vandersteen, I couldn't... Uh, agree with more. Just a great, great individual and again surrounded by good people here. So happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have you. And again, it's just been a little over two years. It's amazing how quickly the time flies. What's your impression been thus far? How, how's it been going? I would say it has been going great. Uh, when I think back over the past year, we started out on a little bit of a sad note for me. Uh, Joan Ketterman, who had worked for the department I mentioned, knowing mm -hmm. several people from mm -hmm. Sheboygan County, Joan Ketterman was uh, near the top of that list in terms of people I have known. She retired at the beginning of the year after about 30 plus years of service with the county and she was such a great support to me that I was saddened to see her go. But as you mentioned, uh, we still have many, many excellent staff. Um, over this past year, Liz Mollick, um, who is the manager of our economic support division, was recognized by the Wisconsin Counties Association she received a Friend and County Government Award for her work in proposing a regional service delivery model for income maintenance that ultimately was adopted in the state budget. Um, we've continued on a very, very positive path of keeping uh, kids and other individuals out of institutions, supporting them in the community. Um, we've continued to enjoy great support from our Health and Human Services Committee and Mike, as I mentioned, and yourself and uh, we just delivered our 2012 budget without uh, any variance in terms of meeting the levy target. And I think we've got three years running now where we will see the end of the year achieve a positive variance and a result in a fund balance for us. So overall, I would say things are going extremely well. Yeah, that's an excellent, concise summary and things are going well. I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, please start big picture. You mentioned economic support. What are the divisions that report to you in their uh, area of responsibility? Uh, in general, the Health and Human Service Department is charged for the most part with delivering safety net services. So we're organized in four divisions. So what does that mean? An economic support that uh, is a division that provides uh, health insurance and food supplements and financial assistance to persons who may be unemployed or underemployed. Uh, in terms of public health, we manage uh, communicable disease and community environmental health. Our social services division uh, investigates and responds to child abuse and neglect and juvenile crime. And then our community programs division 
uh, responds to emergency mental health needs and adult protective issues. Beyond that, though, it's also important to me that we provide proactive and uh, preventative services. So some examples of that could be found in immunizations that we provide for school-aged children. Uh, we offer early intervention supports for kids experiencing developmental delays. <coughs> and um, our Aging and Disability Resource Center, which is located in Sheboygan Falls, does an awful lot to promote wellness and, um, and a positive experience for persons who are growing older or uh, have disabilities, and they do that for, through a variety of means, including educational programs. There's a monthly cable show called Independent Lifestyles that they offer for the general public. So from my perspective, it's important for us uh, to engage with the community even when safety net services aren't needed so that um, we have a positive relationship and people understand the work that we're doing. And you, as you mentioned, have such a good team in place, some very experienced, knowledgeable division managers, but just uh, staff throughout the department are so skilled and knowledgeable. And again, providing those critical safety net services. And in today's economy, uh, a lot of folks out there hurting, a lot of businesses have tightened their belts, mm -hmm. a lot of homes have tightened their belt with their, their their budgets. What's happening with health and human services in your department? Have you seen less demand or have demands for your services increased? I came here in 2009 and uh, if you recall the the national economy um, was uh, hitting bottom if you will or what we thought was bottom in late 2008. We saw the banking industry uh, needing support. The mortgage industry was in bad shape and so in 2009 I anticipated that we would see record demand and that proved to be true. What I did not expect Adam was that that trend was surpassed in 2010 and we're still on an upward uh, trend with with that experience. So in 2010 for example requests for energy assistance grew by 12 percent over our 2009 record year at the end of the year, we had 10,000 households that we were assisting in paying utility bills. Uh, food share applications grew by 22% in 2010. And at the end of the year, we were serving about 12,000 people with food supplements. And um, Medicaid health insurance grew by 6% over our 2009 record levels. And at the end of the year, again, 16,000 uh, county residents were receiving health insurance through the Medicaid program. And I know for me, I have to admit that as I was a um, younger person and before I was involved in this type of service delivery, I used to think about people in need as somehow different or it was, you know, I was always blessed with a good job and people who needed assistance fell in a different category. But uh, it's important to understand that today it's not about them, it is about us. And we've seen some significant changes in the community, people who've had ranch homes and teenage children and good jobs and dreams about college for their children experiencing sudden job loss. Um, and that could come through companies like Thomas Industries, Pentair, Kohler Company. So folks who never thought they would need assistance mm -hmm. are the ones that are walking through our doors in recent years. So it's a little bit, you know, humbling to see that happen, but uh, uh, glad that we can offer some help to them when those needs arise. Demands for services are clearly up, as, as you uh, highlighted, and yet there's pressures on government at all levels to hold the line. Mm -hmm. You briefly mentioned earlier that your department has been very successful in that regard, doing more with less. I think the county as a whole certainly can um, with pride speak to how we've tightened our belts yet been pro providing greater resources, greater services. We're the right arm of state government, federal government, so I anticipate with these substantial increases for our needs for services that you're seeing more revenue from the state government, from the federal government, more dollars being passed on to help you meet these growing demands. Is that the case, Tom? It's actually, in truth, it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, we are a conduit 
for many state and federal resources. So when we talk about Medicaid benefits as an example, we talk about food share as an example, we are a conduit that helps people gain access to those resources. So in fairness, um, as needs have increased, so has that level of resource. But what hasn't increased is any dollars that would be associated with administering those programs um, or with state contracts for purchasing services that we provide locally. Instead, we've seen those things stagnate in recent years, and so as demand has increased, we've had to do more with the existing staff that we have available. We've had to squeeze more services out of limited uh, contract dollars available to us. And this upcoming year, as an example, we've seen actual reductions in state funding. Youth aids, for example, will be decreased by 10 percent or about close to $300,000. We just received word that we'll be anticipating a, an additional 7.3 percent on top of that. And at the same time, the costs for service, whether it's provided locally um, or at the state level, continue to increase. So just as the state is reducing youth aids made available to us, they're increasing the costs of juvenile correction service that we need to purchase from the state when required. It, that's increasing by 5 percent. So we're a little bit squeezed on both ends. All right. If you follow this program or follow county government, you'll know that this is really an area of frustration for those of us associated with county government, particularly those of us involved with putting the budget together. Many of the programs that we provide are mandated or required by the state of Wisconsin. We, we need to require these safety net programs, and for good, good reason. But the funding, su sufficient funding to carry them out has not been provided. In fact, more and more of the burden or pressure has been put on the local property taxpayer to help subsidize or pay for these state mandated programs. Tom, if the state fully funded the programs that they require us to implement, how much approximately in, in property taxes could be saved or reduced if the state met its funding obligation? Mm -hmm. Again, that's a little bit of a fuzzy line, Adam. Mm -hmm. You know, we are mandated to provide services. How we do that, what amount we provide, is a little bit negotiable. Right. But if you consider our budget at $32 million, the levy contribution there is $13 million. So in its purest form, if we're providing services that the state is saying by statute we should provide, one could say that $13 million of local property tax relief would be achieved if the state fully paid for those services. In fairness to the question, though, many of the services that we provide uh, have required a 10 percent local match, and they did that by statute years ago. Sure. So if, if we were to meet our 10 percent local match obligation as the statutes originally defined, we would be contributing about 3.2 million instead of 13 million. So it, it, since, since uh, we've been delivering services, we have contributed at varying levels. We are, in fairness, doing some things that make sense locally that the state might argue we don't need to do. We value senior meals, for example. We contribute a little bit to that program beyond what we're required to. Uh, some of our public health initiatives, state could argue we don't have to do, but we do it because it makes sense and the community values that. So again, the answer with all of that would be, in a generalized figure, Adam, uh, we could see close to $9 million worth of property tax relief if the state provided full funding for the services we're delivering. And as you and I know, and I think most people appreciate the state's fiscal track record has been horrendous for so long that there are no position to provide more funding to local units of government. In fact, it's been going mm -hmm. the other way. Mm -hmm. I think of late, uh, they've gotten their fiscal situation in a little better shape, mm -hmm. but we certainly aren't going to see more funding. Mm -hmm. And let me transition back to the county. You know, your department is one of 20. Sheboygan County is, is the only county that's reduced property taxes for the last five years, mm -hmm. yet, our, yet demands for our services have gone up, particularly in health and human services, law enforcement, programs like that. How have you been able to deliver budgets that haven't put more burden on property taxpayers yet continue to sustain programs and in some cases broaden or strengthen the program to serve more people? Um, 
I need to acknowledge, first of all, it gets back to that staff that you mentioned very early on. Uh, without the contributions of our staff and our contracted partners, none of that would be possible. So with the help of those individuals, uh, it, it takes several approaches. First of all, cost containment. And I mentioned early on that we felt good about keeping people out of institutional settings. When we can do that, we save money. We support them in the community with lower cost alternatives. In 2005, for example, we were spending $1.1 million on residential care for youth. Last year, we spent $333,000. In 2005, we spent $1.4 million on juvenile corrections. Last year, we spent $325,000. So again, providing community-based versus institutional care saves us a great deal of money. We've also expanded some revenues. An example I can provide you of that is um, children with certain eligibilities for Medicaid can be um, gaining access to Medicaid revenues through state and federal governments that help pay for services otherwise that would have to be paid for by levy. And uh, our average revenue generation for those children for the years 2006 through 2010 was about 400000 per year. For 2012, we budgeted $1.1 in revenue on that line item. Um, I would say, too, that we've, when positions have opened up in our department, and again, we've not grown as a staff. Instead, we're pretty selective about position replacement, and we're more selective about position assignment. So for 2012, as an example, we're going to be assigning one of our public health nurses to work with our ADRC. That does two things. One, it allows us to draw down grant revenue to pay for that nurse in replacement of levy, and it adds medical expertise to the work we're doing through the ADRC. Similar example, when a social work position opened up recently, rather than refilling it as a child protective worker, we've filled it as a uh, children's long-term support worker, which allows us to gain access to those federal dollars that I just made mention of. So again, it's moving positions around that allow us to capture uh, additional revenues and improve programs. And lastly, Adam, the, the thing that we're trying to accomplish, and it's going to be several years in the making, is movement toward integrated care. So what does that mean? It means that we've got four operating divisions, and it's very possible that one individual could be seen in each one of those divisions for a different reason. Mm -hmm. The more we can come together as a staff and develop joint plans and singular goals, we'll be better off, and in cases where we still need individual goals, we can at least reinforce the work that's being done in other divisions every time we have contact with that individual or family. So with that kind of approach, I believe we'll achieve some additional efficiencies down the road. One of 20 departments, we held the line countywide, and one of the other reasons, as you know, is all employees now are contributing more toward the cost of their health insurance and as well as contributing now 50 percent toward their pension. Uh, this was a major state initiative, but one of the things I really want to shout out and thank our employees for is we were already leading in that regard, as you know. Our employees already were contributing 10, 12 and a half percent toward their health insurance. Now it's closer to 15, uh, depending on whether or not you participate in our own in-house wellness clinic. And as for contributing toward the pension, we had been talking about that for years, a tougher nut to crack, and certainly Governor Walker took that on uh, to some folks' um, disappointment. But our employees were contributing toward their pension even before Governor Walker and state employees were. Again, because I think we have a team in place that knows they all need to be part of the solution, and that certainly was a significant contributor toward us balancing our budget, holding the line. As we look at what's going on at the state, I was just reading the paper before this, we started taping this program, which will be aired, I'm sure, a few weeks from now. The recall of Governor Walker is in play, and you know, there's, there's so much angst, I think, in the state right now and division about should of this happen, should that have happened, should employees not 
be able to bargain like they used to, what have you. A lot mm -hmm. of change in the mm -hmm. air. And what are some examples of some of the change that have recently come out of this new administration that are impacting specifically the Health and Human Services Department? Mm -hmm. Well, you made reference to the employee contribution issue that has provided us with some uh, budget savings uh, beyond what we would have realized previously. So I think that needs to be acknowledged. And I think you referenced that for the individuals involved, that hasn't been well received necessarily, that hasn't been um, perceived as, as, as a, a good outcome, but it does help us in terms of achieving our budget goals. Some of the other things I think in general, uh, government as it currently exists, and, and I'll focus on health and human services specifically, um, it's, it, the reality is it's going to be increasingly difficult to sustain over the long term to maintain services at the levels we've known and the variety that we've come to appreciate. So I think that we're seeing an erosion of support for county government, health and human services as it currently exists, Adam. Um, in the governor's proposal, uh, budget proposal, he had suggested that we would eliminate income maintenance services at the local level and centralize that at the state level. Well, that sounds pretty good when we're in a climate where, um, you know, mandated services are not fully funded. Our first response might be, okay, that's fine. The fly in the ointment was that um, the governor also proposed to take our tax levy in doing that. Um, and the state's track record in delivering that service was not nearly as good as what our local staff have achieved. Waiting times to access service were extended, in some cases waiting on the phone for two hours. Uh, application processing could take six months or longer to get through. And error rates, as we've seen through state centralization efforts thus far, have been in the range of three or four percent. Locally, our staff have achieved zero percent. So we didn't really embrace that notion um, out of hand. It was instead something that we felt we needed to uh, stand up against and change. So uh, that was the reference I made to Liz Mollick earlier. We will be delivering as part of a regional consortium um, and, and look forward to that uh, activity and hopefully we'll be able to deliver on that within the dollars available. Beyond that additional erosion of support that will impact us down the road uh, the family care program that we've talked about for the last couple of years um, has now been capped in terms of enrollment. We'll be returning to waiting lists. And uh, the Medicaid budget in particular, the state has just recently submitted a plan to save $550 million um, in Medicaid expense if the federal government approves that. So we'll see that play out in our department, in our community, in a variety of ways down the road. Yeah, the new norm, as they say. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned not only the outstanding employees we have in the department, the important work they do, mm -hmm. but all these contract providers and different agencies we work with. And you and I have both provided a leadership role with the local county United Way mm -hmm. and the very important programs that they support. And uh, last night, you and I both participated in a county economic development corporation meeting where we talked about just how blessed this community is with the partnership between the private sector, the public sector, mm -hmm. our nonprofit organizations. It's a caring, giving community. Mm -hmm. And the Health and Human Services Department can't do it all alone. As you know, you rely on a lot of nonprofits, mm -hmm. contracted employees, uh, participants out there. Talk a little bit about the importance of those relationships and, and the importance of United Way and the agencies they help support in order mm -hmm. to maintain services to the neediest of the needy. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Again, uh, we can't do it all alone and we have received such extensive uh, gracious support from the community at large, whether through a contract relationship, uh, more importantly donations. I had a conversation with uh, campus dean Al Harderson here at UW Sheboygan just this week and I think Al came to this community from Illinois. I came here from Brown County and we both compared notes and said that until you've come here from elsewhere you can't appreciate how important this is. So we do receive uh, by way of donation in kind as well as cash support from individuals 
private citizens, professionals, community organizations. Um, I heard that this year we received mittens and blankets from the inmates at Kettle Moraine Correctional Institute uh, from their crochet program, which is just amazing to me. And in terms of business support, um, Acuity Insurance, uh, I feel at some level has adopted our department. I'm not certain why, but we have seen such generous support from Acuity and from Ben Salzman in the years that I've been here that we are absolutely blessed. Yeah. Mr. Salzman was recognized last night for being the Sheboygan County Economic Driver of the Year and, and did, uh, his, one of his staff mentioned your department in particular for the very important work in this community and it was a wonderful evening with a lot of important stakeholders. I think we had about 600 people in attendance. Absolutely. And United Way was mentioned as well and the mm -hmm. importance of the agencies that they s support. I think we raised about 2.1, 2.2 million last year. We're looking to hit that if not modestly exceed it this year and it's just so important to leverage those resources mm -hmm. and services with your department and the important work you do. We only have a minute remaining but the winter season will soon be upon us here. Folks will hopefully have enjoyed their Thanksgiving turkey by the time they see this run and Christmas will soon be here but with these times again there are a lot of folks who are hurting, some struggling to pay their heating bills, some you know, struggling to put food on the table. How do they get help? Where, what would be your advice to where they can turn to or if a neighbor knows another in need, mm -hmm. where can they go for help? Most of those needs that you're describing, Adam, would be best met through our economic support division, which is located at the Job Center, mm -hmm. which is on Wilgus Road. I believe the address is 3620 Wilgus Road. Uh, general phone number there is 208-5800, so uh, encourage folks to make contact there. I'm always happy to receive phone calls if people have difficulty navigating the system. Uh, I can be reached by email or you can find my phone number online by going to the Sheboygan County Government website and always happy to hear from people. And then economic support number again, that general line folks can call? 208 5800. 5800. And if they don't have the information you're looking for, they'll certainly be able to help direct you. Tom, always a pleasure. You covered a, a lot of ground in a short period of time. I respect and appreciate your leadership. It's so good to have you in this community. And it's so important, the work that you and your staff do. I thank you for joining us today. I appreciate being here, Adam, and always appreciate your support. Thank you. Next month, we'll have our Highway Commissioner with us, Mr. Greg Schnell. As I mentioned, the winter season is going to be upon us here very shortly, and Greg will talk about the priorities of road uh, maintenance and winter driving. And uh, again, Greg Schnell, Highway Commissioner, if you have questions, concerns about your roads or what's happening in the transportation delivery system here, don't hesitate to contact him. Another very important department in Sheboygan County. Thank you for joining us. As I mentioned on the onset, if you had a chance or you get an opportunity, please give a shout out to Chairman Mike Ma Vandersteen. I'm hoping he's gonna be back with us soon. And until then, have a very good and safe and enjoyable holiday season.